my lovely, lovely Ips. We're going to get a little bit of a bonus segment today. Uh, a content creator I very, very much respect. Um, it uh, By the name of Jesse Gender um, has put out a video called Privilege and Nonviolence. And apparently it addresses some topics that I talk about very frequently on this channel. Uh, as many people who watch me regularly know, I am a uh, rather uh, avid Second Amendment supporter. I know, imagine that, you go further enough left, you get your guns back. Um, and I've made a number of videos specifically talking about this and expressing my you know, nuanced opinions on why I think that lefties uh, should embrace the Second Amendment uh, and that we desperately, desperately need to build a better gun culture in America that is not dominated by the psychopathic, hateful, and bigoted far right. Um, I actually think it's really, really important to uh, the future of a uh, of of politics in the United States of America. Um, so I want to watch this video and react to it. I don't know what to expect because I've never actually heard Jesse Gender's uh, opinions on guns. So this should be pretty interesting. Um, as you guys know, um, I have a lot of respect. I've praised Jesse Gender in the past, so I imagine this will probably be a very thoughtful video even if I disagree with some of the takeaways. Without, oh, oh, without any further ado, let us watch this video. Oh, there's Jesse Gender. All right, let's start it. Hello, interwebs. I hope you're all doing well. So I want to kind of have a video discussion where I want to introspect about a recent choice that I made surrounding an editing decision on the video that I released on my main channel on Friday surrounding the anti-trans bigotry that is growing more and more in the United States. Because I think this introspection that I'm having about the choice is something that I think we all need to be doing a lot more in a lot of our uh, sort of advocacy as we work to fight growing um, authoritarianism and fascism within the United States. Especially for those of us who sit at an interesting intersection of having both uh, certain levels of privilege uh, in our country, especially being white like I am, uh, while also having, you know, uh, many different intersections of being oppressed as I am as a woman uh, and as a trans person. In the video that I released on Friday, I had a sort of much longer discussion about the need to use uh, self-defense in the face of violence being stoked against uh, trans people. You know, right now, clearly, we are seeing a gr rise in anti-trans rhetoric that is stoking violence against trans people, whether it be stochastic terrorism or it be state violence, like legislations being uh, pushed against us, uh, and many other different uh, ways that uh, violence has been sort of targeted at the trans community. And in that discussion, I talked about sort of this ongoing discourse that's been having right now around, you know, trans people being seen as violent and bullies when pushing back against these, uh, these authoritarian and uh, harmful and genocidal rhetorics. One recent example of this discourse in microcosm was surrounding a uh, recent counter-protest to Kelly J. Keene Minchel that happened in New Zealand and Australia, where Kelly J. Keene Minchel, the uh, anti-trans figure, a uh, turf, uh, got hit with tomato juice. And I argued that, you know, moments like that, where there is some sort of I, I don't. I hesitate to even call it physical violence because it's like tomato juice on her face. But some people would argue it is an assault. That that is warranted in the face of um, you know harm yeah, being done to the trans community, and that when we sort of push back, whether we you know. I feel like the Harry Potter thing got sensationalized really bad. Oh, the like the Hogwarts legacy thing. The Hogwarts legacy thing was over sensationalized on every single side. I hate to sound like an enlightened centrist, but that's just, it's just true. Um, everybody was being pretty, uh, pretty hyperbolic in my opinion about that. Um, to the degree that I think that it yielded a very, a basically useless discourse. Um, I made a whole video about it, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I think that, uh, I, I personally felt like the uh, the Hogwarts legacy conversation, that whole greater internet discourse was just a giant fail. Um, that is true, Somniostatic. Lucy did raise a thousand dollars for Trevor product project while streaming the game, which I think is pretty cool. So 
but I genuinely think that there was a lot of hyperbole on both sides of this issue, the pro boycott and the anti boycott side of things that just that were led to a very, very uh, unproductive conversation. And it's not always like that. Not every discourse gets that unproductive. It got really toxic. Um, anyway, let's go. Punch Nazis in the face or do things like that. That is self-defensive. That is a thing where you are pushing back against people stoking violence who are often able to um, make their violence seem invisible through the use of state power or just using respectability politics. And one thing I mentioned in the video was there were people who understandably balked at this argument, who said, well, we should try to not use violence in any form. Uh, we, should, we should use nonviolence. And one of the things I said in the video was this. But even beyond the anti-trans talking points, there are many people who were trans supportive who seemed to balk at events like this. That we should be nonviolent in the face of violence being done against us. I don't agree with the soup thing. What goes around comes around, and it may become a method or acceptable action to be taken by the other side against trans people and their allies. Great that the people are motivated to peacefully support their allies in such numbers. A call for- Well, I'm gonna let- I'm gonna let Jesse talk about her thing, but to address that comment specifically, like, they're already doing worse things than soup. I mean, I mentioned that a local bar near where I live had a bullet put through its window a day before it was it was hosting a adult, like an adults targeted. It wasn't a kids event. It wasn't a daytime event. It was a drag event. Uh, and they had a bullet put through their window uh, uh, as a result of that. So worse things are already happening than that, than soup. For civility to say, well, we should just debate them in the marketplace of ideas or do nonviolent protests against them. I certainly very much understand where these comments come from. In fact, just a few years ago, I very much would have echoed them. They come from a understandable place of not wishing any violence to have to occur and being upset at seeing violence happen. And the sometimes sweet, earnest, and somewhat innocent belief that the right cause can win without violence. And while I definitely think that nonviolence has its place in movements like this, and I think we should try to use it as a first tactic, it is sadly at the point where that may not be continually able to be the case. But we must remember that events like Stonewall, which sparked the modern LGBTQ rights movement, was itself a violent riot against state power. Sometimes you need to throw a brick at people who are willing to do more violence against you and your body. World War II itself was a- To add some context, as you all know, I did a, a whole video, a whole history mama on Stonewall, um, Stonewall initiated because a, uh, a, a bunch of queer people were being brutally arrested, uh, during a raid on a gay bar because raiding gay bars for being gay bars was legal at the time. It was legally allowed. In fact, hold on, I'll show you. I actually have right here a shirt from from Stonewall, which is a it is a print of what was originally ho uh, uh, hung on the wall at Stonewall. This is a raided premises, Police Department, City of New York, Howard R. Leary, Police Commissioner, and um, this was sent to me by a fan. Uh, but uh, it is a it is a depiction of what was originally posted in the in the in the Stonewall Club uh, because they wanted their patrons to know that the police would regularly raid and if you looked like you were being gay they would haul you off and put you in a concrete cell. So just context for when people say you know Stonewall was a riot that's why it was a riot. Let's continue. War against fascism that was only won through violence. Violence is not something to be sought or desired, but fighting fascism is. While fascism and authoritarianism often gets to hide its violence through the utilization of state power, scapegoats, and stochastic terrorism, trans people and other marginalized groups who are harmed are often doing self-defense for ourselves quite publicly. And to be very clear, I am not sitting here being like, yay, I'm very excited about that fact. We also need to be honest about it. Sometimes beating fascism cannot be done or stopped non -violent. 
Mrs. Mrs. Welcome to the website chat. Uh, first time chatter on the website chat. We love to have you here on the IP chat. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, my channel has a unique and devoted website, which is uh, run by the wonderful people over at White Forest. Um, and you can come join the chat at demonmama.com forward slash live if you want to chat here on the screen where all the, the funny names and the cute emotes are. Uh, so we do stream on YouTube and we have an active YouTube chat, but we also have a website chat that's a little bit cozier and you should come on over. Welcome to the chat, by the way. Violently. And it's important to note that when people are doing that, it is not because they themselves are violent or hateful. They are doing it out of self-defense. Trans people pushing back against fascists calling for our genocide through state violence are being self-defensive. We are not the ones instigating the violence. And I still agree with that statement to a certain extent. It is understandable that there are people who are like, I don't want to see any violence used because, you know, they don't like violence. And, and that's an understandable uh, impulse. You know, we shouldn't want to use violence. I hate violence and I abhor violence. But the other thing that I didn't put in the video is this discussion about how that viewpoint is also coming from a certain place of privilege. There are people who don't have the privilege to not be able to push back against fascism and hate and bigotry. You know, we have True. to be self-defensive because people True. are literally causing violence against us. And to say that we should just take it on the chin uh, is usually coming from people who aren't in direct harm. You know, that's why we have that poem that goes, you know, first they came for the socialists, then and da 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 da, -da so on down the line until they came for me and there was no one to stand with me. It's because the person, the perspective of that poem is from someone who thought like, well, I don't need to stand up for, for them. You know, I'm seeing them being harmed, but like, I don't think we should be like fighting back that way because they had the privilege to, to not be worried at that moment for their own personal safety and how it's important for uh, not only uh, people to fight back against these things when it is targeting them, but how other people should recognize when people are being targeted and come after them, not sort of rest in their privilege and say, no, no, I actually need to stand up for these people because they're being attacked and later on down the line I could be attacked too because I am fascism is a machine that constantly looks for another target to uh, oppress True. to order to fuel its endless need for a uh, cult of death cult of war endless like infighting and um, sort of binary like us versus them rhetorics so that element is well, they very constantly need fascism is is it's fueled by hate um, like it is fueled by it, you, fascism is a, is basically People call it a death cult. It's like a war cult. Fascism needs an enemy to constantly be organizing against. Otherwise, you cannot power the the type of oppression and authoritarianism. You can't convince people that it's worth living the horrible lives that you have to live under perpetual warlike militaristic uh, uh, you know society um, without having a convincing enemy. And so there always has to be one. Um, and and the the easier it is to create that enemy as uh you know as bigger than it is um the better the the more defenseless the enemy actually is the easier it is to turn it into propaganda to fuel a uh a zealous obsession with fighting with war with self-sacrifice in the name of, of 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 combat in the name of defeating the foe that threatens western civilization so yeah it is uh, you know, Jesse is, is on point right here with this. Much, uh, you know, that desire to not wish to uh, engage in violence or, you know, self-defensive violence uh, to be able to push back against Reddix does come from a certain level of privilege. Now, that was something that I, I didn't even really think about discussing in the video because I was sort of writing the video very fast. I mean, I wrote this video in two days and things like that. But one thing that I did write and actually shoot for the video, but ultimately took out because I felt it was a bit of a sidetrack and now I'm realizing much more that it actually was very pertinent to what I should have been discussing, was there was a moment in the video where I actually called out people who were quoting Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, in videos that I had done earlier on that week where I discussed the Kelly G. Mitchell situation to argue for nonviolence. Basically, they were arguing that Martin Luther King Jr. was a man who argued for nonviolent protest in the face of, uh, you know, harm being done to the black community. And that's a, an example that we should follow. And uh, I'm going to show you the part of the video that I cut out 
Um, and then I want to have a little discussion afterwards about why I cut that section out of the video beyond just me feeling it was a bit of a sidetrack. So here's the section. And please, by the way, do not quote Martin Luther King in my comment section as I saw other people in my other videos comment sections do. While I completely understand that you are coming from a desire to not wish to see violence done, and I understand and empathize with that, it's important to remember that Martin Luther King Jr. himself was open about the sometimes regrettable need for violence in the face of hatred and violence being enacted against marginalized groups like black people that he was an advocate for. And he realized this before he himself was murdered violently, despite his repeated usage and calls for nonviolence to be used first in fights against discrimination and bigotry. Also, Martin Luther King Jr. was super anti-capitalist, by the way. Like, honestly, Martin Luther King Jr. is highly extraordinary in many ways. But the myth of Martin Luther King Jr. being a revered saint who worked to end racism solely through nonviolent and individual means is a narrative that is often wielded by conservatives yeah, to preach the is. idea that we should only be fighting those causing harm in the marketplace of ideas. And this is this is super this is super accurate what 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 Jesse is saying here. Um, that that like there has been a a relatively successful uh, attempt to basically rehab. Uh, Martin Luther King's image to make him uh, non-threatening to the current status quo. And it's something that people should be aware of and should guard themselves against and push back against. And in fact, family members of Martin Luther King Jr. have pushed back against people trying to basically frame him as somebody who would basically say, no, you, you, you should only ever uh, basically take it on the chin and turn the other cheek. Yeah. You'll you'll hear this all the time, by the way. We've actually we've actually covered this directly on on this show. You'll hear this used by conservative talking heads very frequently. It's unfortunate. Jesse being based, yeah. Jesse's often based. There's a reason why I really like Jesse Gender and and her content. Nor that systemic injustices even exist. A narrative which ultimately only serves those who cause harm because it legitimizes their arguments and pushes the idea to remain neutral in the face of violence being enacted especially if that violence is being made invisible through systems and utilizations of state power, like anti-trans legislations are. Today is the anniversary of the assassination of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. I was thinking, like, if he were alive today, I wonder what he'd think about such dismissive comments and about a Democrat party that believes it can regain power by living in a constant state of protest or racial hatred and denial. Every one of us has a right to equal treatment by our government. That right is guaranteed by our Constitution. It's the heart of countless laws passed with well-deserved fanfare by our Congress over many decades. That right is inscribed on a monument on our National Mall to the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., who would be shocked and disgusted if he watched Susan Rice on television today. Okay, so I very much stand by you know, what I say in that uh, section. And I want to sort of go a little bit further for just a second here. In the last few years before Martin- Yeah, I know we're about to talk about Tucker getting ousted. How, how perfect. By the way, if you're watching this video on, uh, on YouTube, or actually if you're watching it live, smack that like button and don't forget to subscribe. Because uh, if you go to my channel, you'll actually find a video of us talking about Tucker getting fired, which if you're live, you're gonna see in a few minutes. Anyway, make sure you check out my stuff. Uh, we'd love to have you. Let's continue. Luther King Jr. was uh, assassinated, was murdered. He started to become much more leftist and sort of anti-capitalist uh, and anti the system that oppressed many um, people of color, black people, and many others. Uh, in fact, here's a famous quote that a lot of people know, um, but, uh, but sort of missed the beginning part of it. Let me say, as I've always said, and I will always continue to say, that riots are socially destructive and self-defeating. I'm still convinced that non-violence is the most potent weapon available to oppress people in their struggle for freedom and justice. I feel that violence will only create more social problems than they will solve, that in a real sense it is impractical for the Negro to even think of mounting a violent revolution in the United States. So I will continue to condemn riots and continue to say to my brothers and sisters that this is not the way 
and continue to affirm that there is another way. But at the same time, it is as necessary for me to be as vigorous in condemning the conditions which cause persons to feel that they must ga engage in riotous activities as it is for me to condemn riots. I think America must see that riots do not develop out of thin air. Certain conditions continue to exist in our society which must be condemned as vigorously as we condemn riots. But in the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not mm. been met. And it has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice, equality, and humanity. And so in a real sense, our nation's summers of riots are caused by our nation's winters of delay. And as long as America postpones justice, we stand in the position of having these recurrences of violence and riots over and over again. Social justice and progress are the absolute guarantors of riot prevention. So, as you can hear at the beginning of that quote, is Martin Luther King Jr. saying, firstly, that, like, the ability for black people at the time that he was alive to fight back against the system was ultimately going to be very harmful to black people. And so he argued for nonviolence because that was the way to cause tension within uh, the system uh, and force the system to try to acknowledge and, and work for uh, black people to sort of stop the oppression of black people. And so he sort of recognizes not the fact that violence shouldn't be used, but ultimately he believed at that time that violence was something that was going to basically be a losing uh, battle for for black people, considering how ubiquitous the system is. But as he got later in his life before he was murdered, um, and I should call it FD Signifier's amazing video that is not released yet, he's going to be going into this in further detail. True, Nana. Uh, but one of the things that Martin Luther King Jr. sort of was wrestling with as he got further into his life was becoming more anti-capitalist, more leftist, and starting to understand that the system that, um, you know, oppressed black people and, and many others needed to continually be fought back against and pushed back against, and that it is often a uh, conservative rhetoric that sort of erases this part of his history to just say you should call for nonviolence just like Martin Luther King Jr. is. I'm not saying every conservative, uh, every person who says like nonviolence is the way in quotes Martin Luther King Jr. is a conservative, but it is a conservative rhetoric to uphold the status quo, saying like, use nonviolence because if you use nonviolence it'll disrupt the, the status quo and we don't want to do that, it's, it's, it's harmful. Uh, and so it ultimately keeps uh, propping up the status quo. You'll also also notice that the same the very same people who constantly say just be nonviolent just be nonviolent then immediately uh, advocate for the dispatching of violent riot police highly militarized SWAT teams against nonviolent protesters um, that's another thing that you'll constantly notice I mean I just was talking about this on Twitter uh, in Montana uh, a bunch of peaceful protesters showed up to protest the passing of three blatantly anti-trans bills in the Montana House. And what do you know, but a literal battalion looking like stormtroopers from fucking Star Wars come marching in with riot shields to forcibly remove them while they were explicitly practicing nonviolent First Amendment protected speech. Let's continue. Of the system. And this is something that I think Martin Luther King Jr. himself, uh, again, I'm sort of coming off the cuff as not like a deep scholar of his life, but something that, you know, seemingly he was wrestling with as he got further and further into his life uh, and, and started to recognize that the system was being harmful. So that's something that I encourage you all to learn more about but from FD's video. He'll go into it in much greater detail, and I think it, it's a really great video. But the mo last thing that I want to analyze in this little discussion that we've been having here is 
the other element of why I took that section out of my video. Because I did say earlier, and this is true, I thought it was a little bit of a sidetrack from the point that I was making. And now I'm realizing, given everything that I just said, that it was actually a very pertinent thing to what I was saying. But I also have been doing a little bit of introspection, and I realized that the other reason that I did this, and I, I don't know if I was even conscious of it because I was editing and kind of dealing with a lot of other emotions at the time, but I, I sort of sit in here and be thinking about like, yeah, maybe that was a, an emotion that I was thinking was the fact that, you know, by putting that section in the video, and maybe even by putting it here, there might be people who react uh, negatively to this, is that some people would take that as, as an affront to them and say like, oh, Jesse, uh, they might have been people like cis people who were like trying to listen to the video and were agreeing with my points, um, but then they would have felt like I was confronting them and calling them a bad person for, for you know, wanting to quit MLK. And I realized that is, was an impulse on my part to not wish to make people look at uh, this history of Martin Luther King Jr. To look at the fact that, yes, this man was someone who was understanding that we needed to fight the system and uh, didn't want to make people who I wanted to come out of the video feeling like, yeah, we need to fight the system, as I say in the video, feel bad for maybe having quoted Martin Luther King Jr. and not understood that element of Martin Luther King Jr.'s life. And by censoring that part of the video, again, I don't know if this was conscious or not, um, but by censoring that, I, I sort of was trying to take away that moment of self-introspection on the part of the people watching the video because maybe they would have had a sort of like balking reaction at that. And I understood, and I'm understanding now that that was an element of my privilege to be, to want to cut out that section of the video for, uh, so not to confront certain people in my audience, with with that reality of the long history of Martin Luther King Jr.'s life. And it's something that I need to be better aware of because I think, you know, it is important for me to constantly point out the intersectionality of so many of the fights that um, trans people that, you know, I am uh, are, are facing alongside many other groups. You know, I've constantly talked about how the issues that trans people are facing in the United States are not ones isolated to just trans people, but are often intersecting with many other things like anti-Semitism and racism and things like that. And then on top of that, how many of these uh, intersections make uh, people of color within the trans community, like black folks and especially indigenous folks as well, um, face even greater harm. You know, indigenous trans women and black trans women and many other trans women of color uh, face a lot more harm than I do as a, as a white trans woman living in a state that is fairly trans affirming in the United States, despite the fact that, you know, I do face a lot of harassment and hate and things like that as well. But it is much more compounded for many others um, who aren't of my class or my race. And so I think that that is something that I I need to be aware of that I am sometimes, you know, I, I try I'm, I'm, and I hope you all are seeing this, that I am trying my best to to be more conscious of that and trying to center that more and more and more. But I am on a learning journey on that. And I think that, um, you know, I kind of want to be open about me being on a learning journey, not mm -hmm. so that people don't hold me accountable and say like, oh, Jesse, she's just, she's just getting, she's just learning. She's figuring out. But to let all of you all know who may be on a similar learning journey as me to know that it is a process of constantly introspecting and not letting that introspection make us feel paralyzed. We, we shouldn't feel like, ah, oh, we, we can't do anything, but to confront it in a way that allows us. To well, that's something I've talked about too, is like uh, that, that, I mean, not directly related to this particular subject, but I've talked, you guys know, I've talked on here about how um, it's really easy when you're, when you're in a position of being a marginalized person with any level of public platform, regardless of how big it is, that there's a there's so many people who will get mad at you for basically whatever you say, that it can be tempting to basically spend all your time doubting your own words and second guessing everything that you're saying. And it can be paralyzing and it can actually lead to a diminishment of the good that you can do with your platform just because uh, if you're constantly spending your time like trying to predict what people are going to to like be mad at about what you've said, um, you can actually end up not doing the advocacy that you wanted to do in the first place. It's a uh, yeah, it's it's a rough thing. I I completely uh, I I completely sympathize with with Jesse on this one.
to have a more open and frank discussion so that we can stand in better solidarity with um, you know, other communities that we are not a part of, but are also facing a fight that we are fighting uh, all together against a system that harms us all in many ways. And also be more inclusive of the people who are within our communities that we you know, hope to, to work within, like the trans community for myself, uh, who are more harmed and, and bring their voices forward for themselves and not speak for them, but try to acknowledge them more and try to bring them forward much more as well. Um, and this is something I'm going to be doing much more in my videos. I've been trying to do already in my videos, but it's, it's, it's something that I just sort of like sat and thought about, even though it was like a two second part of my video and realized, you know, I think, you know, I could have not had this discussion and maybe this video will, you know, get people upset at me, but I, but I hope I you understand so. that I'm making this video off the cuff because I want to kind of acknowledge that this isn't something that, you know, it should be something that is like sat down and thought of when you're making videos and, and content and writing, but it's also something that we wrestle with in our everyday thinking about how we think about the world. So I want to show you, hopefully, me wrestling with it as a person rather than as a person who wrote a script and sat down and performed a video for all of you. Um, hopefully that all made sense. And, you know, if I said anything yeah. dumb or offensive... Um... Nah, you didn't. You didn't. No, no. Jesse, much love for Jesse Gender. Uh, obviously, we don't agree on everything, and that is totally fine. You do not have to. But I think this video was perfectly fine. I do think that there's, um, I guess one thing that I would say is, I, I do think there are, I, I mean, as is displayed by the sort of uh, complicated nature of even discussing this, I, I do think that there are some limitations to privilege as a, uh, as a political construct, um, or... That's not the right way to put it. Uh, as a as a topic, um, and I've talked about this before. You guys know that I have, uh, you know, that I'm rather critical of the overuse of discussions of privilege. Um, but there is a value in pointing out the fact that, yeah, actually, a lot of people who are basically like thumb their nose at um, at the idea of. Uh, of like more aggressive counter uh, uh, counter protests, more aggressive protests in general um, are coming from a position of not being under immediate threat. Um, when I was covering the George Floyd uh, uprisings, um, that was a, a constant thing that we saw was people who were sitting in very comfortable positions where they were not in immediate danger, basically judging and looking down on people who were immediately threatened um, by the police departments that were engaging in the type of violence that got George Floyd murdered. Um, and yeah, so I, I think, uh, but but I do think that there are limitations to discussions of privilege because, of course, um, people will take the idea of or the concept of privilege and take it to basically absurd ends where uh, they're, they start trying to, like, do mathematics almost about who has... Uh, who is the more privileged or less privileged person um, when in reality there is more shared struggle than there is uh, like unshared struggle. Um, even trans people who uh, l live in a state like the one that both Jesse Gender and myself live in, Washington, we both live in a state that has at this point uh, very, very good but hard won uh, protections for trans people, um, even in states like this, you are not fully safe. There are entire sections of the state that are very far right wing. And as public figures who do our job on the internet, we have, people have access to us in ways that, that, uh, that don't directly correlate to where we live. Um, just because I live in this state doesn't mean that I can't be targeted by people literally all over the globe. And the same thing goes for um, for Jesse Gender. So I actually really liked this video and I thought it was really, really good. Um, uh, much love for Jesse Gender. Uh, uh, as we always say on this channel, imps only raid with love. So if y'all want to go check out uh, this video, I'm going to drop the link right here. I'm going to drop the link here. And the link will be in the description of this video. I'm going to add it actually right now. Um, here we go. Reacting to at Jesse Gender. 
Um, and so that's going to be there. Boop. There's the video. So you'll be able to check that out if you want to, and you can go check out Jesse's other videos. Um, good video from Jesse. I think it was a fair analysis of the complexity of talking about these subjects. And also, I think it, what was most valuable is uh, very specifically explaining how the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. and the legacy of nonviolent protest is misrepresented by people who do not have any interest in freedom or, or in liberation for anybody. Um, but but uh, yeah, um, if you enjoyed this little quick react, uh, if you enjoyed this segment, smack the like button, smack the subscribe button, and don't forget to leave a comment, because those comments mean the world to me, and I would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, thank you to everyone who recommended this video, and thank you to Jesse Gender for making this video.